so the, the I mean, the theme is, uh, I think, really the you know consumer search and, and platform recommendations. So, um, how do I move forward? This is the two screen setup that I have, still haven't figured out. There we go. Okay, so these are the papers that we're going to see, and I'll, I'll talk more about each um, in turn. But before I do that, um, I, I want to give a sort of view from from ten thousand feet here. So, so a starting point for this session is. There's information frictions in markets. Okay, so um, you know after your econ 101, that's pretty much the next thing I I, I tell my students is that uh, can be hard for consumers to to figure things out. Now those frictions come in all sorts of ways. There may be frictions about price, quality, specific attributes, your particular match with with the thing. There might even be information frictions about what kind of products are out there? What are the op where are the opportunities to, to buy? And the extent and nature of these information frictions um, don't exist in a vacuum. Um, so I, you know, there's decisions that people take that affect the nature of these frictions. So uh, from the consumer side, that's a search process. Uh, what set of goods do I look at? Uh, how do I go about that process of figuring things out? And eventually I have to make a purchase decision or a decision not to purchase at all. Um, there's mediators that take actions as well. So we're gonna hear from, uh, from Tat Hao, from Andre, the platform's role in the availability of goods, for example, that I, that I might be able to, to take a look at. Um, we're gonna see from Charles that, you know, notions about uh, recommendations that, 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 that uh, these agents might uh, take into account. And similarly, there's actions that firms are going to take that are going to affect the nature of the information and this consumer search process. So that might be pricing decisions that are going to affect what, what people ultimately end up buying, but also what they look at. It's going to kind of come up in, in Stefan's presentations. Um, they might describe their products in a way that make attributes particularly salient. They might, get, might make it easy or difficult for consumers to, to get information. They might choose to engage or, or, or not. I mean, they might give up if, if they are worried about being discovered. And, uh, you know, uh, Dan will appreciate that the, 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 these things uh, have implications for product design as well. So there's an awful lot that's potentially going on and more than, you know, any one paper can handle. And so what we tend to do as researchers is... Uh, switch on or off particular aspects of this to answer specific questions. So, you know, I mean, we saw it yesterday in the brilliant and wide ranging and overarching um, introduction from, from John Vickers in the, in the plenary for those who were there, uh, who was thinking about uh, uh, taking as fixed the consumer interactions and not worrying at all about where that comes from and thinking about the implications of that for pricing. Now, of course, it's natural to ask, well, where do these patterns of interaction come from? How, what's influencing them? How are they responding to uh, decisions that different actors are, are, are taking? And so I, I think some of the papers that we're going to see in the session drill a little bit further on that. Um, OK, so like I say, things can get very complicated. Lots of attributes, lots of products out there individual actors, what they know, what they think about can be very complicated. And, you know, one response to all of that, and we're going to see that from Stefan, is to say, well, let's just look at the data. You know, I mean, we're, we're in a world where uh, it's easier to do that than it ever has been. We can see the search process directly. Let's do that. And I have no idea why some consumers are looking at these goods, but I know that consumers who look at these goods look at them together. So I... I mean, I find these things easier to think about with concrete examples. Um, right now, the concrete example I have in my mind is, um, turns out that, you know, the, the stock price of S S Smith & Wesson went up by 20% in the last three days. A lot of people who weren't previously thinking about buying guns are thinking about buying guns. I don't know anything about how to go about buying a gun. So one thing that I might do is, you know, go on a website and look for, guide to buying guns or 10 best guns. Now, the, 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 if, I, if a lot of people are looking at that same 10 best gun list, then you're gonna see um, 
those particular guns look like substitutes to each other. And that might be unrelated to attributes. It might be unrelated to, to anything else. That's, that, that's going to be kind of a feature in Stefan's paper. Um, I don't know anything about guns. now. So as I'm searching for them, I might find out that uh, something described as a you know, three caliber and something described as a five inch turn out to be the same thing. When I figure out that those things turn out to be the same thing, that might change the way that I do my search going forward. Okay, that's going to be related to, to Charles's story. It's not exactly the way that that's framed, but, but, you know, these kinds of things where I discover something in the search process that changes the way I do the search, it's going to affect the way I do things. Um, the guns are, are heavily regulated. <laughs> uh, in, in, in some places more than others in, in, in the US. But, you know, I mean, there are regulations and there are rules that change who can buy, where they can buy, how, how to govern that. And, and, and these rules around that govern where and how people can buy are going to affect prices, are going to affect decisions. And, and you know, Tat Hao presents some kind of reduced form on these rules of how to buy on particular platforms, what kind of effects they have. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can buy these things in many places potentially. And uh, Andre's paper and, and the paper I have with, with Sandra are gonna be related to, to, to that aspect. So there's many different aspects of this search process, what that means for markets. And these different papers are going to uh, um, look at these, these different aspects. So I think the approach here is more in the spirit of focusing on one particular aspect to gain relevant insight on some particular important question uh, than, than, than the big overview, which for those who are worrying about the, the big policy questions that are real and substantive at the moment, um, and we're seeing many big policy questions, it's, it's a little hard to get an, a notion of the big picture. And so if you're Coming here to get a, a, a view on that, I think you're going to end up a little disappointed. Um, so sorry, but uh, uh, I feel I should advertise appropriately. Okay, so uh, you know what, what Stefan and, and his co-authors do is focus very squarely on the demand estimation aspect. And they're going to really rely on the richness of available data to say we can gain a lot of information from the search um, process which we can directly observe as well as just the purchase behavior. So um, they're going to kind of aggregate the search process much more than Charles does actually. They're just going to look at the list of things that I've ever looked at and not really think about the sequence of where I'm looking in that list or why I'm looking at one thing rather than another. But they're just going to say these things tend to get looked at together more often. That tells us something about substitution. We're going to use that. And a uh, key for them is that the likelihood of being in a consideration set as well as the likelihood of being purchased are going to depend on price. And so that's going to guide their pricing decisions and that's really going to be what they're focused on. Now that's going to be very clean. It's going to give a lot of uh, insight onto the pricing decision. But if you want to think about um, decisions that affect consideration other than price, uh, it, 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 you know, they're, they're dealing in a relatively reduced form way. That also is going to make it hard to think about uh, uh, welfare questions, for example. So it, it, it's very well focused for a particular question. It's an important question for, for uh, marketing guys in, in particular, maybe. Uh, but, but, you know, there's going to be limits to what they can do. At the same time, Charles is going to... Uh, use very rich data to think about the dynamics of the search process. Okay, so in his world, people perfectly know, you know, know everything about uh, the goods, what attributes they have and so on and so forth, but they don't know how much they care about the attributes. By going and searching, they start to learn a little bit more about the attributes and uh, that's going to affect their search process going forward. Um, very good. So. Uh, the, there is some precedence to this. I mentioned this to Charles earlier. So in the marketing literature, there's, there's this um, relatively well-known book called The Adaptive Decision Maker by Bettman, Payne and Johnson, who follow guys in the housing market and say, you know, people, when they search for houses, they start out, 
they figure out things like, you know, they see a house, you know, in Toronto, you see a house with a, with a mudroom, thanks Dan. You see a house with a mudroom, you say, oh, a mudroom, that might be important. And maybe I start to pay attention more to that going forward. Uh, you know, housing is very interesting because um, these are very, very complicated products. And, and I have a personal interest in this because my wife used to be a real estate agent. You know, one thing that she would do is she would start her, anyone who wanted a rental in Manhattan, she'd take them to five different buildings to start with, because then she could tell, did they really care about the view? Did they really care about the kitchen? What were the attributes that mattered to them? And talking to them wasn't nearly as effective as showing them examples of, 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 uh, of these goods. Now, that also kind of goes to another aspect that Charles draws out, and I think that's kind of relevant to the design, is the intermediaries here play a role. So her choice, you know, I mean, she would never stoop to such things, but, you know, ordering the sequence in which she showed them stuff might lead them on the margin to maybe, you maybe show the worst stuff first and, and, and show something that's relatively decent after to kind of encourage them to, to, to buy the thing. So there's scope for this sort of, I don't want to call it manipulation, but, but steering or, or whatever it is. Um, now, Charles's, Charles's paper gives a route to think about that because this path dependency in, in the search process. And I think reading these papers together um, made, made me think Stefan and his co-authors might also think, can we force things to be in consideration sets or restrict the set of consideration sets that we look at might be a way of thinking about these kinds of questions in the context of, of their papers. So, um, you know, respecting the probabilities with, within a subset of, of, of the uh, consideration sets that, that, that you're thinking about. Something like that might, might, might give another uh, policy that you could look at within within your paper. I have about two minutes left. Um, so Tathouse really focused on the uh, uh, intermediaries problem. So, uh, we just talked about one aspect of the intermediary problem, the sequencing of orders. He's gonna take a very reduced form approach to that, give some examples of what that reduced form might correspond to and explore the implications. Um, critically is going to show that some governance decisions are going to move markups and volumes in the same directions, but others not, and trace through the implications of that for what kind of government, what kind of intermediary uh, design decisions they're going to take and how those vary with um, revenue and fee structure. So I'm racing, but you're going to hear more about these things uh, from these others. Uh, Andre's paper... Um, you know, I, I, I didn't see that much of, uh, but, but, but my understanding here is that the focus is really that uh, some consumers can buy from the platform or buy from elsewhere, uh, and different fee structures are going to affect prices here and elsewhere and, and can affect that decision. So they're going to start out with a neutrality decision, sorry, with a, a neutral situation, where uh, charging a referral fee or charging a transaction fee don't have any effect and think about what changes that and, and when the platform is going to be more interested in using one fee rather than another. So they're very focused on the business model of the platform and how that affects where consumers ultimately purchase. This question of where consumers purchase is also the one that Sandro and I look at. So, you know, what happens if all of a sudden Walmart uh, doesn't allow you to buy guns from Walmart anymore, as happened six months ago, or whatever it was, uh, how does the availability to buy the same good at different venues affect pricing? Uh, the, you know, the availability of these different goods at different venues has to affect shopping patterns. Those shopping patterns feed through into pricing, and we're kind of focused on that equilibrium of the consumer behavior in the shopping pattern. So, uh, you know, the kind of bottom line is these choices are, are, there's a lot going on, consumer search, intermediary design, seller strategies, they interact, they're complex. One model to, to capture everything that might happen here is, is unlikely. These are likely to be kind of application specific things An empirical approach um, can be helpful for that. I think seeing these papers together, as I tried to hint, might, might, might give you things about, can we use questions from one paper does that affect how we think about some of these other papers? And I applaud the, the organizers for, for a coherent set of papers here. 
Um, for those who feel there's plenty of scope to learn more, let me let me flag that there are venues to to do that going forward. So I I, I think it I I mean I shouldn't be the one advertising a, a TSE uh, seminar series, but there is one on the economics of platforms, and I think it starts uh, next week. And there's also a, a digital uh, series on specifically on consumer search uh, that's organized uh, through through Vienna, I think. Uh, so I think I'm at time and I will stop there. Great. Th thanks, Hesky. Thanks a lot. This was a great introduction and a great shout out to uh, TSC's uh, uh, platform series that's uh, starting again soon. And so next we have uh, Stefan Seiler uh, from uh, Imperial College London uh, to talk about large scale demand estimation with search data. So Stefan, go ahead. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. No, you're okay. Now we go. Um, all right. Well, thanks so much to the organizers and thanks a lot, Hesky, for setting this up wonderfully. I think that may, will make it a bit easier, hopefully, to stay within my eight minutes. So I'm going to jump right in here. As Hesky was saying, what we're particularly interested in here is to think about estimating demand in large assortments. And so what you sort of want to have as a mental image in your mind is something like estimating demand for the digital camera category on Amazon. So in a lot of online contexts, we tend to have large assortments. What often comes along with that is that we have a long right tail of products that are purchased relatively infrequently. That makes it hard for us to really learn about demand uh, quickly. Moreover, as we're adding more products to our assortment, we tend to cover the relevant characteristic space more and more densely. So we'll have a lot of products in the assortments that are arguably quite similar to each other. So if we think about estimating demand and maybe even the joint price setting problem across the assortment, substitution patterns are arguably a first order issue. Now, what sort of sets up the key tension here is that the object of interest is really high dimensional. It's the cross price elasticity matrix across maybe hundreds of products. And at the same time, we have sparse purchase data to work with and that makes our life difficult. And so what we're gonna propose here and, and Hesky already talked a little bit about this is to add search data to the purchase data. And we'll argue that search data is gonna be particularly powerful in helping us understand substitution patterns. And that's at least for two reasons. One is that core occurrence in search is gonna indicate substitutability between products to us relatively directly. So if two products are always searched together by a lot of consumers, that should tell us that consumers deem those products to be similar to each other. And hence there's gonna be a higher degree of substitutability. Moreover, search data and so by that, I mean the identities of products that a consumer looked at before making a purchase tends to be much more abundant in purchase data. So in our setting that will eventually take the model to, we're going to have 30 times as many individual product page views as we have purchases. So we have a lot of data to work with, and it's data at the product pair level that's really informative about substitution. So what I'll do for the rest of the presentation is to tell you how exactly we operationalize bringing the search data in a micro-founded and consistent way into the demand model. So we're going to draw on a well-established literature on consideration sets that, that's mainly in the empirical realm. And we're going to think about the, uh, the search process at the individual product level. So there's going to be a probability of an individual product to be included in the consideration set of a particular consumer that I'll denote as a probability IJ. So this is a product specific inclusion probability that's going to depend on a function VIJ that I'll define for you in a second. Now, given that we have these individual product components, the probability of a set occurring is simply equal to the product of these individual products inclusion probabilities. Now, so far, this is sort of standard plain vanilla setup that you might see in other empirical papers. So the main thing that we're going to bring to the table here is to specify the function VIJ that drives this consideration process in a very flexible way. So let me kind of dig into that particular aspect. So again, we're going to have these specific product specific inclusion probabilities, those are gonna be modeled one as a function of price, Hesky was alluding to this. So especially in the online setting, when you change price, it's gonna, and we'll see this in the data, it's gonna make it more likely that somebody searches the product. It's not just gonna shift purchases. So we want a price effect here. We're gonna have a product specific term that's gonna capture things like saliency. Some products might be searched more often because they're presented on the homepage of the web page. Uh, there's going to be an error term that's mostly there for computational convenience. And then what I primarily want to home in on is this gamma tilde term, which is going to allow for correlation and search probabilities across products. And here's the place where we're going to allow for a lot more flexibility than most papers have done. And in particular, 
we're going to allow for these gamma tilde terms to be drawn from a multivariate normal distribution where we estimate the covariance structure in a fully flexible way. Once consumers have decided which products to consider, they're then going to make a choice condition on consideration that's essentially going to follow a standard discrete choice demand model framework. So I'm, I won't spend time on this here. So again, homing in more on the gamma tilde terms here, we're going to allow for a flexible correlation structure. So these terms are going to be drawn from a multivariate normal. It's centered at zero because we already have product specific terms for these intercepts. And we're going to estimate all the covariance terms in a fully flexible fashion. Now, in a setting with 50 or 100 products, which is ultimately where we apply this to, that's going to be a lot of different terms. So there's kind of two things to consider here. One is, do we actually have enough data to pin them down precisely? I won't have time to show you this here, but there's so much data, even at the level of a pair of products, of how often they're searched together, that we're actually going to get a relatively high degree of precision. A second issue is how we actually handle this computationally. So even if we have enough data to back those things out, non-linearly searching over hundreds of parameters is difficult. Now it turns out because these covariance terms drive how often certain products are searched together, there is actually a contraction mapping equivalent where each covariance terms rationalizes how often a given pair of products tends to be searched together. And so we're gonna have a sort of BLP style contraction mapping, but not on purchase shares, but on core search shares, and that's gonna loosen up the computational constraint. And so that's actually something that's relatively new that in the working paper version, some of you might've seen isn't there yet, but I think that makes for a much nicer setup uh, than what we had before. Now, in the remainder of the time, I wanna just very quickly run you through a very simple example. So I'm gonna parameterize some of these functions and just show you sort of the mechanics of how flexibility in the correlation of these gamma uh, tilde terms, which is the model primitives that we estimate, how that translates into co-search patterns and that translates in turn into cross-price elasticities, which is what we ultimately care about. So here I'm gonna consider a setting where a consumer chooses across four products. There's no outside option. I'm gonna introduce a vertical aspect where the first product has a higher gamma bar term than the next product in line. And I'm gonna have correlation in search between products A and B and products C and D, but no other correlations. For the conditional choice part, I'm gonna assume that only depends on price just to keep things as simple as possible. So here's, here are the patterns that, that that kind of model generates. So what you have here is the core search matrix. So on the diagonal, you have the marginal probabilities of each of the products being searched. What you see is the level difference that comes from the gamma bar terms. So product A is searched more frequently than product B, et cetera. More importantly, maybe for what we're doing here, the correlation in the gamma bars is gonna translate into correlation of the core search probabilities. So A and B are frequently searched together Products C and D are also frequently searched together. Now, unsurprisingly, that leads to cross-price elasticities that follow the co-search patterns. So products A and B have a higher cross-price elasticity because a prerequisite for substituting is that you actually have those products in the set together and the same for C and D. So the key logic really is we're gonna allow for correlation in gamma tilde terms. That's our model primitive that's driving everything. That's gonna to lead to more co-search which is observed in the data and the gamma tilde terms are fitted to that. And that's in turn gonna allow for flexible cross-price elasticities that are directly informed by the search data. So I'm almost out of time, I'll wrap up here. So what we did is to integrate search data into a demand model. We did it in a micro-founded way that borrows from an established literature and consideration sets. We allow for flexible correlation and consideration probabilities. That means substitution is driven by co-search probabilities and so the one thing that we're not getting is we're not unpacking where those correlations come from. And this is something that has to be highlighted. That might be interesting in other regards. The advantage is that we're getting these very flexible patterns. So if you want to understand the shape of the aggregate demand function, it's very suitable for that. And we use a computational trick to match co-search probabilities, which loosens up computational constraints. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stefan. That was perfect timing. Um, great. So next up, we have uh, Charles Hodgson from Yale. Uh, to talk to us about uh, spatial, spatial learning and path dependence and consumer search. So Charles, Charles, go, Great. go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We can't see your screen. Hang on, here it comes. Perfect. There it is. All right. Great. So thanks very much to the organizers for including this paper and thanks to Heskey for a great introduction. Uh, so this paper is going to be about consumer search and in particular about spatial learning and path dependence in search. 
so the the canonical model of sequential search basically has consumers drawing uh, alternatives at random, observing the utility from those alternatives until the consumer hits some reservation utility, stops searching, and purchases the, the highest utility alternative that, that was sampled. This model, uh, you know, it's, it's widely used, but typically it doesn't allow for learning across alternatives. That is to say, when I sample a product J, that tells me about the utility I'm going to get from that product J, but not about the utility I'm going to get, not anything about the utility I'm going to get from other products. And it has little to say about the sequence in which search takes place. So the start of this paper is the observation that in many environments, learning about the payoff from one object is potentially going to change uh, consumers' beliefs about the payoff from other objects. So for example, you know, if I'm uh, shopping for a TV on amazon.com, and I read some reviews about a particular technology or a particular brand, I might make an inference about uh, the, how much I might like other products of the same brand or use it, that use the same technology. So there's some sense in which learning about one product might inf inform me about other products that I haven't yet sampled. Uh, when consumers make this kind of inference across products, what I learn about one product determines not only whether I'll continue searching or stop, but also what, where, what I view next, where I go next. So in this paper, we develop a model of what we call spatial learning, uh, which captures this intuition in which the observed utility from a sampled product informs beliefs about unsearched products. Uh, this correlation in beliefs is a function of the distance between products and attribute space. So more similar products are going to be more highly correlated. And the presence of this spatial learning in this model induces path dependence. So what I learn about the first ob object I view influences where I go next, not only whether I keep going in my search process. So I'm going to very quickly outline the model. Uh, the idea here is that a consumer I obtains a utility from consuming product J given by this function, uh, where the consumer observes these product attributes X, J, X ante. These are observable at the time of search. And the consumer's problem is to choose which product J to search next. Uh, the utility function is basically the sum of this function M and an IID uh, noise term epsilon. And both these terms are X ante unknown but consumers are going to learn about this function M as they search. So let me uh, show you very quickly what that looks like. You know, we're going to assume that this function M, this utility function is drawn from a Gaussian process. I won't go through the details here, but I will just illustrate it with a figure. So on the left here, uh, we're, we're illustrating a one dimensional example where the X axis is the, the product attribute dimension. There's a one dimensional product attribute, it goes from zero to hundred. And the Y axis is the consumer utility. So here the dashed line represents the consumer's prior belief. So here they have, they have a flat prior, they, they're indifferent across all products ex ante and the gray area, the gray shaded area is the one standard deviation of their beliefs. And the yellow uh, line here is going to be the, their true utility function, that M function that they don't know that they're learning about. So if the consumer samples a product here in location 20, they might observe a utility given by this red cross, which is equal to their M function plus some epsilon noise. Given this, up, this observed utility, the consumer is going to ups, uh, update their beliefs to this posterior distribution here. As you can see, they're updating their beliefs about the utility not only at the observed product, but at other products that are nearby according to some uh, covariance function. So that's basically what the consumer's learning problem looks like. Um, now, I'm not gonna go into detail about the consumer problem in this and how we, uh, how we estimate the model, but I'll, I'll just jump ahead and give you some of the results from the data. So the data we use to apply this model uh, is data on consumer search that comes from Comscore and it was previously used by Bronnenberg, Kim and Mello. Basically, we see about a thousand panelists who are searching for digital cameras online and we see the sequence of product pages they observe and then the product they ultimately purchase. So we basically see the sequence of their searches. What we're going to do in the paper is re report stylized facts about these search path data. So we're going to show patterns from the data and then show that we can replicate those patterns uh, by estimating a structural model of search with spatial learning, and that those patterns cannot be rationalized unless we include spatial learning in, in our model. Uh, so a couple of, I'm gonna just highlight two of the main uh, patterns here. The first is that the distance to the product eventually purchased declines over the search sequence. So here you can see the search percentile, which is how far through my search sequence I am. And on the y-axis here, this is the distance of the products currently being viewed to the product that's eventually purchased. So consumers are basically getting closer in attribute space to the product they eventually purchase as they go through their searches. Uh, so initially they're gonna search a wide variety of products before narrowing in to search products close to that product that's ultimately purchased. So this narrowing of search is the first of these uh, uh, stylized facts we want to highlight. 
So what we do is estimate the structural model of search with learning and then simulate data, simulate search paths using that model. And we, uh, using that model, we are going to be able to simulate a pattern that looks pretty similar to the data in which consumers are getting closer, narrowing their search as they go along this, this attribute dimension. Uh, when we shut down the spatial learning element in our model and re-estimate it and re-simulate it, we aren't able to replicate this narrowing of search. So we think this is, you know, suggestive that that spatial learning is what, what might be driving this pattern. The second pattern that I want to highlight is jumps in attribute space. So basically, these are four columns are regressions of uh, step sizes in the search sequence. So this is how far, how the difference between the price of the teeth product search from the T minus one product search. Uh, same for pixel, zoom, and display. These are digital cameras. Um, and this theta term is a measure of how frequently the product J is purchased relative to nearby products. So these regressions are basically telling you that when a consumer observes a product that's rarely purchased, they're more likely to step further away from that product in attribute space on their next search. So basically low quality products drive consumers further away in attribute space. Um, and again, as with the previous pattern, when we uh, when we estimate and simulate the model with spatial learning, we're able to replicate these patterns, these jumps. And when we shut down spatial learning, we cannot replicate those patterns. Uh, so, so these patterns, I think, are suggestive that spatial learning might be happening in consumer search. Uh, we're able to also use our structural model to estimate the value of this learning in terms of consumer consumption utility. So here, the blue line here is uh, expected consumption utility from simulated data. The x-axis records, so the y-axis records consumption utility, and here the x-axis in blue is changing consumers' beliefs. So at one, consumers have correct beliefs, and they're updating beliefs, their beliefs about other products correctly. As we go from one to zero, consumers are going to be under-extrapolating from one product to another. Uh, and so what we show here is that when there's no cross-product learning, utility is reduced by 12%. In other words, consumers would have to search 25% longer if they weren't learning in order to uh, obtain the same utility as consumers with correct beliefs. So the last thing we do in this paper, and I'm just going to talk about this in the last 30 seconds, is uh, look at issue of platform power and recommendations. So we're going to use simulations where we let a consumer view a recommended product for free before they begin searching to think about what this spatial learning thing implies for platform power. And we're going to be able to show that uh, platforms can manipulate consumers' beliefs by showing products with high or low utility relative to nearby products and and that's going to potentially change the direction in which consumers search. And this model is going to also have implications for uh, the way op consu uh, consumer optimal recommendations should look. So it's going to suggest that fixing the number of recommended products, consumer optimal recommendations should be informative in the sense that they should be, uh, they should not have high idiosyncratic or low idiosyncratic utility draws, and they should be located in diverse and dense regions of the product space. So I think I'm out of time, uh, but in conclusion, we're basically building a model of search and purchase with spatially correlated learning and drawing out the implications of for um, search for the design of intermediary platforms and search rankings. Thanks, Charles. That was great. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks. And I think that flows really well into the next talk uh, by Tad Ho Te from the National University of Singapore about platform governance. So Tad Ho. Um, Hi, everyone. Yeah, so is the slide showing nicely? Okay. Uh, hi everyone, so thanks for having me here and thanks uh, Hesky for the wonderful introduction. So let me start with background and motivation. Many prominent online platforms such as those listed here uh, operate as marketplaces that enable transactions between buyers and sellers. Such platforms also actively regulate the behavior of their users by setting rules or governance design decisions. Examples include decisions regarding number of sellers, level of quality control, design of search and recommendation interface, among others. Given that online platforms are increasingly prominent in our economy, the important research questions are, how does the platform's choice of governance design differ from the welfare maximizing design? And what drives the possible distortion? In this paper, I develop an analytical framework to, to explore this type of questions. Now, how should we write down a model of platform design? So to fix some idea, let us walk through this final example here, design of search and recommendation interface. You can imagine a simple case of where a platform chooses whether its search interface emphasizes more on the price dimension or emphasizes more on the product match dimension. An interface that emphasizes on the price 
helps buyers to find cheaper product. For example, something like a buy box where a single item is highlighted prominently and whether a seller gets into this box heavily depends on its price. Meanwhile, a greater emphasis on product match helps buyers to find product that fits their personal taste. For example, the interface here lists out all the items that are somewhat relevant and allows buyers to explore different varieties. You can think of the design choice as choosing a point along this, uh, this line here. Now, motivated by this example, the starting point of my modeling approach is that many design decisions uh, have two effects. First, it affects how much gross value is generated from transactions. Second, it affects the intensity of on-platform seller competition, which can be measured by the level of seller markup. In the previous example, shifting the emphasis towards the product match dimension will improve the product match, which raises the value generated from transactions. At the same time, this also relaxes the price competition, which raises the markup that sellers earn. In the paper, as mentioned by Hesky just now, I take a reduced form modeling approach by focusing on how platform design affects this value markup pair. The platform's choice of design is reframed as choosing this value markup pair induced. And the set of feasible pairs depends on the specific design application. In our interface design example here, value and markup always move in the same direction, but this can be different for other applications. And generally, this flexible modeling approach allows us to encompass uh, several other design issues, such as uh, number of sellers, quality control, data sharing with sellers, search friction, among others. Now, let me briefly describe the model. There's a monopoly platform, a continuum of unit demand buyers and multiple sellers. The platform makes its design choice, which affects value and markup. To highlight the main points, assume that platform has zero marginal cost and zero fixed cost. We postulate that for each given uh, design chosen by the platform, the induced seller pricing takes the form of marginal cost plus markup. Now this expression here is not arbitrary and it is actually consistent with various commonly used micro foundation. Each buyer pays an intrinsic visiting cost to visit the platform we assume that the market is conditionally exposed covered, meaning that every buyer that visits the, visits the platform eventually buys one item. Therefore, the transaction volume faced by the platform is simply the mass of participating buyers. What I will do is to analyze this model under various given platform fee instruments. So here's the timing just to wrap things up. For each given fee instrument, platform sets fee level and governance design. Then buyers and sellers participate simultaneously. And finally, on-platform interactions unfolds according to the micro foundation specified. And that has been summarized by the value and markup functions. Now to give you some flavor, I will just walk through the simplest case of per transaction fee model. The per transaction fee on sellers is simply an extra marginal cost to the sellers. So we can rewrite the pricing equation just now as effective marginal cost plus markup. Platform's profit is just transaction fee multiplied by the volume of transactions. By envelope theorem, we can easily see that the profit maximizing design is going to maximize transaction volume or the difference between value and markup. Next, our welfare function is just an unweighted sum of platform profit, seller surplus, and buyer surplus. We can allow for additional weight on buyer surplus, but it won't affect the result by too much. The welfare benchmark here is second best, that is the design that maximizes welfare function subject to endogenous fee response by the platform. Now we want to compare this profit maximizing design and the welfare maximizing design. We notice that profit maximizing design maximizes volume. And so it is going to maximize all the rate terms here in the welfare function, except this markup term. This reflects that the platform focus on the volume. And so it does not internalize seller profit. It follows that the profit maximizing design will be distorted towards inducing insufficient markup compared to the welfare benchmark. Now per transaction fee is just one possible fee instrument. In the paper, I also do a similar type of analysis for other fee instruments such as um, percentage transaction fees, buyer lump sum fees, external advertising revenue, seller lump sum fees, and two-part tariff. My results show that we can put this 
fee instruments or business model into two broad categories. On the one hand, we have volume aligned fee instruments, whereby the platform's incentive is skewed towards maximizing transaction volume. Its design choice is this inclined towards uh, intensifying seller competition and inducing markup level that is too low. In the interface design example, this implies that the platform tends to emphasize too much on the price dimension. On the other hand, we have uh, seller aligned fee instruments whereby the platform wants to protect seller's profit. Its design choice is inclined towards relaxing seller competition and inducing markup level that is too high. In the interface example, then this implies that the platform uh, tends to emphasize too little on the price dimension. Now, let me quickly conclude. In this paper, I developed a framework to understand a platform's incentive across a class of uh, governance design issues. The framework has two main features and results. First, I synthesized multiple platform design issues uh, using a single unified framework based on this value and markup formulation. Second, I focus on how the type of fee instruments or business model of the platform shape its incentive in governance design. And one important implication from this is that welfare analysis regarding platform design could be sensitive to uh, modeling assumptions on the fee instruments available. And I think that's all from me. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Tahoe. Uh, so next up, we have um, Andre Hagu from Boston University to talk to us about platform leakage. Uh, Andre, go ahead. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Or actually, I should say good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, it's really good to see everyone here, although normally uh, we would do this in Toulouse, so I actually kind of missed that. Um, so the paper that, I, that I'll talk about today is uh, called Platform Leakage, joined with Julian Wright. And this is a problem that I think uh, pretty much all of us are familiar with, uh, for, especially for studying platforms. So the idea, leakage is a phenomenon uh, through which uh, participants find each other on a platform but then they decide to uh, take their transactions or their interactions off the platform. Um, and I think I, I would note that this is a, uh, this is a problem that is uh, common for most platforms, although of course it varies in severity. So there's some platforms for which this is like really an issue. So in particular platforms on which participants want to, so each participant wants to find one counterpart and interact with that counterpart repeatedly, the leakage problem is going to be very severe. Uh, on other platforms where there's very one-off interactions, it may happen, but it's, you know, leakage is not as serious of a problem. Now, we can, in, in general, you can think about like lots of solutions to leakage. I'm not gonna go through all of them here, uh, but you know, you can probably broadly think about them in, in two buckets. Some of them have to do with pricing, so the choice of business model and pricing instruments, and some others have to do obviously with the, um, with the manipulation of information. So something that, uh, that Heskey mentioned in the uh, in the introduction. Let me just highlight the uh, the types of solutions that we're gonna that, that we focus on in this paper. So the first one, uh, and this is going to be sort of the main the, the way we frame the paper is uh, the type of fee instrument that the platforms uh, the platforms uh, choose. So they can either charge for referrals or they can charge for transactions. So I'll come back to this. Uh, referrals means I just help. Uh, I just um, refer buyers to the sellers and then I don't worry about where they transact. So I just get my money from the referral and I don't try to charge for transactions. And the other, the other options is obviously to try to charge for transactions, but this is conditional on being able to keep the transactions on the platform. And the other two types of solutions that we, uh, that we incorporate in the, uh, in the model that we have in the paper, you can think about them as carrots versus sticks. So carrots would be trying to provide sufficient benefits to the participants, so buyers and sellers, of completing transactions on the platforms. And on the other side, you have sticks, which is, well, let's try to, pen let's try to uh, penalize sellers who actually try to take buyers off the platform. So you can, the, the penalties could be hiding the sellers uh, from, say, buyer search results. Uh, as Kesky mentioned, we actually have several variations of, uh, of the model in the paper. I'll just very briefly uh, give you a sense of what the model of one of these versions or what the model looks like. So there are uh, N competing symmetric but differentiated sellers. They all have the same marginal costs. And um, there are two channels for sellers. So they can sell directly. Think about this. They can sell on their, on their own website. Or they can sell through a monopoly marketplace, which we call M. 
And we allow the sellers uh, to sell to set different prices in the two channels. So you can set a direct price and they can set a different price uh, potentially on the marketplace. Uh, for the buyers, there's two types of buyers. Um, there's a fraction of Lambda buyers who are uninformed about the seller's existence, which means they actually have to come to M in order to discover the existence of the sellers. So obviously, this is one of the main reasons uh, why platforms are, are valuable. And then there's a fraction of the other, the complementary fraction of buyers, one minus Lambda. They already know the existence and the prices of all the sellers. So they only come to the platform if the, if the prices on the platforms are lower than the prices charged in the direct channel. So what we're interested in, what we're gonna focus on is M's choice of business model. And we're gonna simplify this by looking at two types of business models. One of them, which we're gonna call the transaction mode. So this is the business model in which the platform, or sorry, the marketplace M, tries to charge uh, transaction fees for all the transactions conducted on M. And again, here the issue will be, the interesting part will be, you need to provide uh, sufficient incentives for the buyers and the sellers to actually conduct the transactions on the platform. Uh, and the second option is to charge referral fees. So this is basically saying, I'm actually gonna give up trying to convince buyers and sellers to transact on the platform. I'm just gonna charge for the, uh, let's say the initial match or the, the initial introduction of buyers and sellers. Afterwards, they can decide to transact whatever they want. So, the leakage problem obviously arises whenever a platform or marketplace tries to charge transaction fees. And in our model, this looks like this looks something like this. Um, any given seller may actually decide to undercut in the direct channel to induce consumers to switch to the direct channel precisely in order to, um, uh, to avoid the transaction fees charged by the platform. In response to that, the marketplace will actually hide. So it has, it has the option in our model to hide any such seller and then steer the uninformed consumers to buy from the other sellers who are actually behaving. Uh, and in so doing, of course, the seller who, who undercut in the direct channel is now only going to have access to the informed consumers who can find that seller without going through the marketplace. And then finally, so what that implies is that the transaction fee, which is set by the, uh, by the marketplace, uh, faces a constraint. And the constraint is it has to be sufficiently low so that no seller wants to deviate by engaging in this kind of undercutting and trying to get uh, consumers to, uh, to buy from it in the direct channel. And again, the other option is I'm gonna to try to, uh, so for the marketplace is to charge referral fees, which completely sidesteps any leakage. Um, and by the way, in case you're wondering, so these are the reason we focus on these two choice of business models that these are actually business models that we observe in reality. So there's lots of startups, lots of marketplaces facing this, pro facing this problem. Some of them, many of them charge transaction fees, others, in, uh, particularly because they face leakage problem, they, they've actually decided to just charge referral fees. So the trade-off that we get in this, in, the, in this model is that, well, the transaction mode, so charging transaction fees, does induce uh, higher industry profits. Uh, again, in the setting with um, and greater than two competing, uh, competing sellers. But the problem is the transaction mode or transaction fees that the, uh, that the marketplace can set is limited by leakage and at the same time, potentially by double marginalization. So, you know, we get a trade off that uh, I represent in this figure. Um, so to read it very, uh, very quickly, um, there the, so we, we, we graph basically the frontier between parameter range where the transaction mode is optimal versus where the referral mode is optimal. So, uh, and we do this for uh, different numbers of sellers, of competing sellers. So n equal two, four, and eight. So transaction mode is optimal at the top, or above, the, above the line, referral mode is optimal uh, below the line. And you know, the two things that come, come across here is that uh, more intense competition between sellers favors the transaction modes. So if, if there's a lot of competition between sellers, actually charging transaction fees uh, tends to be, uh, to be better. However, if there are more uninformed buyers, then the referral mode uh, becomes, uh, becomes more attractive. And then we also look at other trade-offs. So in the, um, uh, we have several variations of the model and we also explore some other trade-offs, which I think are quite relevant in practice. One of them is that uh, if we allow the, uh, the marketplace to invest in transaction benefits, that obviously tends to help. And of course, a lot of marketplaces try to fight this intermediation or leakage precisely by trying to make it more attractive to buyers and sellers to transact on the platform versus in the direct channel. And you have to balance this versus double marginalization. 
Uh, and the second one, which I think is very relevant to, uh, if we introduce uncertain buyer demand in our model, then we actually, uh, we create another reason for the transaction mode to dominate the referral mode because the transaction mode is actually better at exposed price discrimination. So you can think about one of the reasons I, I prefer charging uh, transaction fees relative to referral fees, which are actually fixed uh, per, per buyer, is that by charging transaction fees, I actually get to monitor it. I, I can extract more value out of sellers who conduct more transactions with buyers. And if that's uncertain ex ante, transaction fees tend to be better. Uh, Andre, if you could just wrap up quickly. Uh, I am actually done. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, great. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay. And so last but not least, uh, we have uh, Heski again uh, to uh, talk to us about showrooming. Um, so Heski, go ahead. Uh, Heski, I think you're muted. Uh, let me just un unmute. Okay, now you're unmuted, but we can't see your, yeah. okay, perfect. perfect. Okay, so uh, paper's called uh, Search Shim Showrooming and Retail Variety. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit different. So Andre was talking about this sort of showrooming phenomenon, so I'm not gonna motivate it, but our, our story is gonna be a little bit different. We're not focused on the um, platform behavior here really, but we're focused on the, the fact that there's many different places to, to, buy the same, to buy the same goods. So this is joint work with, uh, Sandro, who's at Pompeo and who won't be answering questions in the chat because he's on a, a pretty recent paternity leave. So feel, feel free to send him congratulatory emails uh, after the talk. Um, okay, so the big picture here, the retail environment has changed dramatically. I mean, this is a digital economics conference. Obviously, digital has been a huge thing here. We've seen a shift towards um, e-commerce. Uh, the Hotax and Cyberson document, interestingly, Hotax and Cyberson also document a shift towards um, big box stores uh, over, over small stores. So that's been part of the story of, of the shift in retail as well. Um, you know, we're applied theorists, so we start with um, introspection as a as, as sort of to, as, as motivation. And the introspection I'm starting with here is, you know, I, I see plenty of people showrooming. I also see a lot of people who don't showroom. Uh, that suggests to me some heterogeneity. The fact that there's showrooming means there's different kinds of places to buy the goods. And, you know, there's some places you go to figure out where you want to buy. There's other places you go to actually buy it. Some people do this, some people don't. So our motivation is this happens, not universally. That sort of speaks to some heterogeneity. And that heterogeneity depends on the kind of places that you can buy from as well, on the, um, on the sort of retail outlets that are there. And the kind of retail outlets that are there, do I have access to Walmart or don't I? Uh, how good is my internet connection? Am I uh, you know, somebody's grandmother who doesn't know how to work the internet or not? All of those things are going to affect how I search and how the general population is searching, the mix of different people who are searching in different ways is going to affect prices. And this is an equilibrium. Those prices are gonna affect the search behavior as well. We're gonna be operating in a world of sequential search. So we're gonna be very much in diamond style search models, costly sequential search. You can go from one place to another. And in that world, you know, um, this isn't an audience that I probably need to, to say much about this, searching just for prices as in the original diamond paradox doesn't do a lot to discipline prices. All right. So if people are only searching for prices as in diamond, prices are going to be set at the monopoly level. If people are searching for matches as in Walensky, that puts some discipline on prices. Now these showroomers, they know what it is they want to buy. They're only going to get another price quote. So, you know, if they're searching a la diamond, they actually don't put a lot of discipline on prices. And so these showroomers, their presence, the number of them, that's going to affect how many people are kind of searching a la diamond versus searching a la Valinsky. And that's going to have implications for the price levels at different stores. 
And so the nature of the stores, the ability to do these different kinds of searches are gonna feed through into an equilibrium. So that's kind of the big picture. And the key here is that the people who impose discipline on prices, they have to care about matches. If they don't care at all about matches, then, then, they, then they're um, not gonna be doing any search. If they care too much about matches, then they're gonna to want to go to a venue where they can learn everything there is to know about matches. So they're gonna to go to these very broad stores, find out what they want and either buy there or showroom. They don't put a lot of discipline on matches as well. The people who put discipline on matches are somewhat picky. They care about matches. A bad match will get them to look somewhere else. But there's a good enough chance that they like the first thing they see. So they don't want to go to a broad store where prices might be higher and where, where, where you know, um, and uh, that's really at the, the heart of the model. One thing that uh, is confusing always is, is what a broad versus a niche store means in our world. Broad means wide variety of that particular product. So um, Walmart might be a pretty niche store in our terminology because you know they don't have ten thousand different kinds of digital piano. Um, but whereas Piano World might might have much much more digital pianos. So the model is going to need some stores that are multi-product. We're going to have uh, people search so multi-product stores. But uh, in contrast to Andrew, I saw was on this call before in Jidong's work where, where you have multi-product stores where goods are independent in consumption. Here we're thinking about multi-product stores where these different goods are substitutes. So if I'm going to buy a digital piano, I'm only going to buy one of those. I'm not going to buy uh, two different brands of digital piano. I can go to the broad store to figure out which one I like. I could go to visit a narrow store, try it out, see if I like it. If I don't like it, go to visit another narrow store. Broad stores offer both goods. Um, narrow stores are gonna be of one type of good or another. Consumers know the type of store before they go. So it's gonna be costly sequential search, but directed in the sense that I know if I'm visiting a broad store, if I'm visiting a narrow store. Consumers gonna learn their match value before purchasing. There's gonna be some cost to inspecting. Um, goods. You get a discount at a broad store because you can see both at the same time. So this is what this um, gamma is doing for me is a, is a potential search efficiency from searching at a broad store. Because the broad store is offering the search efficiency, it's going to end up charging a higher price. Okay. And uh, if I already know my match, going to visit another store is going to entail some other cost. You could think about this as the guilt associated with wasting the sales assistance time, or you can think of it as, as literally a visit cost or how, however you want to think about it. So this, this diagram is, is sort of the heart of the paper and the, the heart of the consumer behavior. Um, we're going to have consumers varying in terms of how picky they are. As I suggested, that's going to be key. If you're not picky at all, you don't need to visit more than one good. Okay, If you're way at zero, I'll just buy the first thing that I see. I'm not worried about match. We're also going to have consumers who vary in terms of their uh, uh, visiting another store when, when they all, you know, how much they vary in guilt. Let's think about it as guilt. So, so and, and as we vary across these dimensions, we're going to have different patterns of search behavior for a given consolation of prices from the broad and narrow. Well, I'm already at one minute. Okay, so, uh, so what you're going to see is that it's the uh, very picky... who have low search cost who showroom, very picky with high search costs who go to the broad store and buy there. And it's these searchers who are going to go from one store to another reacting to matches and therefore responding to price elasticity. Now, once we've got that set up, we can then think about the pricing decisions, which is what this next slide does. And we can think about what happens if we shut down various kinds of stores. And you can see if I shut down narrow stores, everybody goes to broad stores, we're in a diamond world. Uh, if I shut down broad stores, you know, uh, then, then other things happen. And moreover, we can introduce, you know, because it's a digital economy conference, we can introduce a sector where I only have access to the prices, but no access to, uh, to learning about match and think about what that does. Interestingly, that can increase or decrease prices um, uh, overall, depending on what kind of consumers that, that price-only sector picks off. 
So the bottom line here is that patterns of search and equilibrium prices are co-determined. Price pressure comes from these narrow searches and the number of those is gonna be determined in equilibrium and is gonna depend on the extent of retail variety. Uh, so sorry for going over and, and thanks for, for uh, your patience. Thanks, Heskey. That was great. So that that, that concludes the, the presentations. And again, if you're if you if you like these, uh, I encourage you to check out the 15 minute uh, talks. And if you're feeling and if you like those and if you're feeling particularly old school, I encourage you to check out the papers themselves.